see you soon from George there. There's Hi. June. Hope to see you soon, everybody. Hello. How are you all, everybody? But going to the church. Guy with all the company problem. Please, please pray. Make sure that everybody has stayed in and God, God bless you all. Hello. How are you all? It's good to see you today because we haven't seen you for a while. I hope maybe that maybe by October we'll be able to see you but we don't know when we're coming back to church. I hope to see you all then. God bless you all and stay safe. Thank you. Hope you are all well. I miss seeing you all in church. And having tea and Hope to see you soon. Love you. Hello, this is the service for Clement Parish Church, Sunday the 12th of July. I'm Gordon Palmer, a minister here at Clement. Also taking part in the service this morning is uh, Martin Russell, who will be reading the scriptures, and Karen Palmer uh, leading us in our prayers for others. It is perhaps the best known verse in all of scripture. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let us approach and worship that loving, that giving God. Love before the dawn of time is our
join together in prayer, and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer, the form of the Lord's Prayer that we use. Um, the words for that will come on the, on the screen. Let us pray. You loved the world. You loved the world so much that you gave your only Son to bring and give the gift of eternal life to all who trust, who believe in Jesus. We thank you, gracious God, that you loved the world that much. You loved the world that much to embrace it and all its suffering. You loved the world that much to come and share its vulnerability, its fragility in Jesus. You loved the world that much that your Son was prepared to sacrifice Himself and die for us that He might bring us back to you. And we thank you for this time to reflect on your goodness, this time to worship our God of love, for this time to say thank you for that great gift, that great sacrifice of Jesus. And Lord, as we do so, might we become more aware of and more receptive of your incredible gift of eternal life. New life to challenge all that is deathly in our world. New life to challenge all that is dull in our hearts. And help us to live in this time of new life in ways that glorify Jesus, in ways that make Jesus better known. Help us to live in thoughtfulness in the coming days. Help us to listen to Your voice here in our service and beyond as we seek to serve in the world. Lord, give us an ear that listens that we may find the words to sustain. Give us an ear that listens, that we might hear your message of hope. And Lord, give us the ear that listens and directs us as to how we admit and acknowledge to you the different ways in which we have fallen short, the different ways in which we have tested and tried your love, the different ways in which we have sinned. And help us to know now the reality and the peace of forgiveness through Jesus given to us. And hear us, gracious God, as we gather up our prayers and the words He taught His followers. Our Father, <laughs> Good morning. The reading today is from Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. For deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. 
I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah on to dry land. Amen. A short time ago, Tear Fund had a survey and which revealed that during this um, pandemic crisis, more people are interested in praying, more people have been praying. Hey, that's a good thing, isn't it? We're going to be running another of the prayer course uh, soon in Claremont. We've had two of the courses um, running. It's a way of learning more about prayer. It's a way of developing and growing in prayer. And I encourage anyone who wants to um, grow in their prayer life to get in touch with me and see if we can um, have folks doing the course together. We've been in groups of six doing it, and that's about an ideal number. Um, it's simply reading, uh, sorry, f watching a video, 25 minutes, it's all online, and then a, an hour's discussion each week, growing in, in prayer together. Something that as a congregation we should be longing to do more and more. Because saying, saying a prayer is one thing, it's not just getting the words out, but who we pray to, having a living relationship with the one that we're praying to, whether we mean what we say, these things matter. And in Jonah chapter 2, the passage that, that we read, Jonah, we're told, verse 1, prayed to the Lord God. That was good. Well done, Jonah, but it certainly wasn't everything, and in fact, we'll see it wasn't really enough. Jonah had tried to get away from God. He'd gone running in the opposite direction when God had called him to go and preach in Nineveh. And not only was it a movement to try and get away from God, it was a downward path that he went on. And the writer um, makes that clear in the way that he tells the story. Um, Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he, verse 3 of chapter 1, went down to, to Joppa. And then he went down, verse 4, below deck. And then in verse 5, we're told he lay down to sleep in the ship. And now in chapter 2, he is down in the depths of the ocean. Down, down. And not until he had gone all the way down was Joseph, uh, Jonah prepared to reconsider and reach out to God. The moderator of the General Assembly of the, the church, Martin Fair, has been doing a, a series um, called It's a Fair Question, um, available through the, the church's website. And it's a series of interviews with a whole range of different folks. And in episode two, um, Martin interviews two guys who both had been addicted to drugs, who both are now clean and both are now Christians. But I was interested particularly in, in one of them as he told his story. He told us of how he, had, you know, got into a, a mess and how he'd kind of begun to straighten out life, life. He'd come off drugs for a while, but then it all went pear-shaped again. And it was only when things got much worse, it was only when he really got to bottom that he reached out for God and found his life being transformed. But like Jonah down, 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 and he had to go all the way down before he calls out to God. It was only at rock bottom was he ready to listen, to be helped, and to be rescued. And so it is, verse 2 of chapter 2, Jonah says, from the deep, from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. It doesn't always have to be that way, you know. It doesn't always have to be that we wait until things are a total mess before we call on God. We don't have to be in a time of serious illness or facing bankruptcy or about to go to court on serious charges. Don't have to have a marriage that's breaking up or to be in the middle of bereavement or whatever. It's just that sometimes in our stubbornness, it takes that kind of serious issue before we turn to God. But it doesn't have to be that way. God is not going to say to someone who calls on Him for mercy, well, you've not suffered enough yet. Come back when you really know what trouble is. No, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. John chapter 6 at verse 37. Whoever comes to me, whether life's good, whether life's awful, whoever comes, 
call on God for mercy, no matter where we find ourselves. But sometimes, as I say, in our stubbornness, we have to be stripped of all our self-sufficiency and brought low. But that's what we need, really, just to be stripped of self-sufficiency, to be stripped of the idea that we can manage, that we can cope, that we have nothing to be sorry about, nothing to apologize for. We just need to get rid of that and throw ourselves in the mercy of God. We just have to realize that we can never make ourselves okay by doing it my way. And old blue eyes will find out that doing it his way was not simply a way to go through life, but it was a way into eternal damnation. It was a rejection of God's way. We just need to be realized that we're not sufficient for everything. And then sadly, not everyone who is brought low turns to God. It is not simply when life is a mess that God steps in. It wasn't just that Jonah was down and down and down, but Jonah had to pray when he was at the bottom. So sometimes I hear folks talk, for example, of God's bias towards the poor, as if being poor was all that you needed for God to do something and, and bring you His salvation. Well, God does have a concern for the poor. The Scripture tells us that, that God is concerned about injustice in the world. The Scriptures tell us that. But simply because we're on the receiving end of injustice, just because we are poor or whatever, does not mean that we're in the possession of experiencing God's salvation. The point about those who have been saying Black Lives Matter is to say there is a, something in the heart of God that He longs for them to be given a fair deal. He longs for all people to be given a fair deal. But more than that, God longs for our salvation. And all of us, no matter our race, our economics, our decent upbringing, our troubled life, our involvement in crime, our respectability, and so on, all of us have to get to that place and that point where we see salvation is only for those who call out on the mercy of God. And we need to see at least three things that Jonas mentions in his prayer. Firstly, our need, our moral need to see that we're not good enough. Now, this clashes with today's era of self-help and, and sort yourself out and all these therapies that will teach you how to get your self-esteem back and so on and so on. We're told, too, that right and wrong are basically constructs of society and that there is no absolute right way and wrong way to do things. Nobody can say what is right or what is wrong for you. Well, the gospel says otherwise. And, the, and, the, and until we come to the point of seeing that before God, we have no defense and no excuses, that we have nothing to say to justify ourselves, then we are lost. And so, verses 3 and 4, Jonah mentions his need. He's been banished away from God. He has been threatened and dismissed because he's a sinner and God's holy. There was no way out for Jonah unless God stepped in, unless God acted in mercy. So, that's the first thing. We need to see that we are not sufficient. We are, we are not perfect. We, we need forgiveness. We need mercy. The second thing that Jonah had to see, as well as his moral need, was his weakness and being able to sort that out. Not only am I a sinner, but I cannot repair or sort out sins for myself. I cannot decide that I am innocent, declare myself innocent, and make myself worthy. Now, again, that takes us to a place that clashes with the world around us. In terms of our moral need, folks are saying, no, no, just here's all the self-help stuff you get to, to be a strong and independent person. And then in addition to that, our society says, no matter what the issue is, we have the, the gadget or the, the, what, the technology to sort this and to fix it. We're used to being a society who sorts all these things out. Whereas people who are above needing help and hand, we can handle all of life's issues. 
Well, that's really why I think the um, pandemic crisis has been something of a storm experience for us, storm in, in terms of Jonah chapter 1. Something that's there to bring us up short and say, wait a minute, you're really in control? Really, you can cope with everything? Really, you have all the answers and you're sufficient for all things? Not really. It's not really as a society and not really as individuals. And by not really, I mean not at all. And so, in verse 6 of the chapter 2, Jonah is beginning to get it. He's beginning to see that he sank down, and he, unless God, second part of verse 6, unless God steps in and, and raises him up, he's had it. So, that's the second thing. Firstly, we are in need of forgiveness and salvation. Secondly, we cannot sort that out for ourselves. And the third thing is that there is hope. There is a message of salvation. Twice in the prayer, Jonah mentions the temple, verse 4, and again in verse 7. He's not thinking about the temple as a special building or as some place where we can feel holiness or the somewhere where he can go and feel this great sense of awe. The temple was the place where, he, yes, you met God, been met with God, but it was the place, it was the holy temple, the place where the law of God, the commandments were kept. You could only approach God, really, if you had fulfilled the law, if you had kept the law perfectly as, the, as described in the Ten Commandments. And the reality is that none of us have done that. None of us have been completely completely and perfectly obedient in everything. We've broken the law. But above the law in the temple, above where the Ten Commandments were, was the mercy seat. It was the seat that spoke about forgiveness. It was where sacrifices were made. Now, the sacrifices that were made in Jonah's time, of course, were sacrifices with uh, animals, with the blood of bulls and goats. But these were but pointers to what was to come. Years later, the writer to the Hebrews says this in chapter 10, it is impossible for the blood of goat, bulls and goats to take away sins. When Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering, offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am, it is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. And by that will, says the writer, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And so the mercy was the place of forgiveness, where the blood of, now the blood of Christ, the one who bore our sin, means that the demands of the law have been met. They have been met not through our keeping them, but through Jesus' obedience as He kept them on our behalf. And just as He kept the law on our behalf, so He died as a sacrifice for sins, not His own sins, but for our sins. Now, this is amazing grace, that God, at enormous cost, bears our penalty so that we might go free. That God, at enormous cost, bears our sin so that we can be reconciled to a holy God. So, Jonah's beginning to get it. Morally, he's bankrupt. He's impotent, unable to do anything about it to win his own salvation. But the good news is that though the law condemns him above the law, there is the mercy seat of God's forgiveness. Forgiveness offered to us in our time, in our day and age, through Christ who died and who rose again for us. And yet, in this prayer, verse 8, this is a bit troubling, isn't it? Jonah says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I will, sh with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. Who's Jonah thinking about those who cling to the worthless idols? 
Is he thinking back to his experience in the boat when in the storms the sailors were praying to any and every god they could think of? Well, that's a bit unfair because after Jonah went overboard and after the storm was calmed, the sailors realized that it was God. And the men, we're told, verse 16 of chapter 1, greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to Him. So it's a bit unfair for Jonah to write these guys off. Maybe he's thinking forward. Maybe he's thinking forward to the people of Nineveh, the people he's going to, to speak and preach to, but as we'll see in chapter 3, when he did so, they received his message and they repented. But unfair again of Jonah. Who's Jonah got in mind? Well, we don't know who he's thinking of exactly in verse 8, but what verse 8 does say is it betrays that Jonah has still got a sense of superiority. There are those who cling to worthless idols, but me, verse 9, but I he's a bit better. He's a bit above. And so, just as he can see the idolatry in other people's lives, he doesn't see the idolatry in his own. Just as he can see the speck in someone else's eye, he doesn't see the log in his own. And yet, verse 10, he's soon released by the fish, and then we will go on to see that his repentance was only partial. Jonah was mouthing the right words to say because of the predicament he was in, and not because he was a changed person. I think there's something similar to the Jonah at this point in the story to where we as a people, as a society are at the moment as we emerge out of this um, lockdown step by step and stage by stage. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I heard people say things like, oh, we're not going to go back to life as it was before. It's not going to be like before. It's going to be a new normal. We're going to learn things. We're going to have different values, different priorities. We're going to show respect to different groups of people because we see who really does things for us. And now as we take steps into a bit more of a relaxed situation, it seems that these thoughts have gone with the wind. They're more interested in getting to the beach, leaving a mess, getting up Loch Lomond side, leaving a mess, getting to the beer gardens where social distance is ignored and so on, getting to the holidays that we, oh yes, quickly the normal, the old normal is what folks are heading back to. And the reason is the same as Jonah. We've not been changed on the inside. The important thing, and, and the salvation of the gospel is not about our circumstances being changed, but about us being changed. It's not that we get taken from, as it were, being in the belly of the fish and then we're brought back to being on the beach. No, it's about God coming to us with His forgiveness, giving us a Savior who through His Spirit comes to live with us and in us, grows the fruit of the Spirit and the new life of Christ. It's inner transformation. And so amazing grace, grace is not just a word, grace is not just an idea, it's an experience. It's a transforming and transformed new life. So Jonah, yes, he makes the right noises and says the right things when he's inside the fish. But as chapters 3 and 4 are going to show, he's not a transformed or a changed person. His repentance wasn't real. It focused on his circumstances and getting out of his circumstances. It didn't focus on sorting out his relationship with the Lord. And yet the truly astonishing thing at this point in the story, and it's a good news thing, the astonishing thing is that God does not give up on him. Even Jonah, who'd tried to run away, who'd hidden, who'd life had gone down and down, and who pleaded with God only while he was in that horrible situation and 
would think differently is when his circumstances were changed. Even that Jonah, God is still God towards, God is still offering himself and his salvation. So maybe you've been in many a church service. Maybe you've mouthed many of the words of our hymns, Amazing Grace amongst them. But you've not meant it. You've not realized it. Maybe you can say the right words, know how to put a prayer together. But you've not meant it. We need to be changed by the grace of God. We need to be transformed by the salvation of God. We need to be made new creations, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. We need to be new people. For that is the way that gospel transformation comes. Not by picking out a wee circumstance here or a wee circumstance there that needs to be changed. But becoming changed people as we realize that we cannot fulfill the law and meet all of the gospel demands, but as we also realize that with God is mercy because Christ has sacrificed himself for us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you so loved the world that you sent your Son. We thank you for Jesus as Savior. We thank you for a grace of God that reaches out to us, that touches, that changes and transforms. And Lord, we ask that you help us not to hide from such a message, not to hide or try to hide from you, not to put up defenses or excuses or whatever, but to realize before you we are imperfect. We are sinners needing saved. Before you, we cannot do anything to save ourselves. But with you is mercy. So help us to truly trust, to truly embrace Christ. And know the peace and the joy of forgiveness within and spilling out into all aspects of our lives that they all might bring glory to you. Amen. Now, Jonah wasn't changed enough by this point in the story, but one person who was changed by the grace of God, the salvation of God, was the hymn writer John Newton. And we're going to sing perhaps his best known hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Grace not as an idea, but grace as a transforming presence and experience. After we've sung of amazing grace, we're going to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And then Karen Palmer will be leading us in our prayers for others. Thereafter, we'll conclude our service in the hymn, Rock of Ages, a hymn that says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Have you done that? Gone to Jesus, no excuses, no bribes, nothing, just simply, I need a Savior and embrace the one who died on the cross for us. But firstly, the hymn, Amazing Grace.
I believe in God. The In today's prayer for others, there is a response. So when I say, Father, through your spirit, we all say together, change hearts, transform lives. So I'll say, Father, through your spirit, and then we all say together, change hearts, transform lives. Let's pray. Let's talk to God. Father, we pray for the comfortable those who do not recognise their need of you. Father, through your Spirit, change hearts, transform lives. We pray for the unsettled, the unsure, those whose priorities have shifted for a while during lockdown, who might have watched a service or two online or tried praying. Father, through your spirit, change hearts, transform lives. Father, we pray for those who find themselves at rock bottom, those who have lost loved ones, jobs, security, health, those in trouble-torn, poverty-stricken countries where COVID-19 is running free those whose homes aren't safe places to be. Father, through your Spirit, change hearts, transform lives. We pray for those confident in their own wisdom and also for those looking for guidance, for leaders and decision makers. Father, through your Spirit, change hearts, transform lives. We pray for those who have run away from you, turned their backs on you. Father, through your Spirit, change hearts, transform lives. We pray for those of us who no longer see life with you as a challenge, who have grown complacent, who no longer speak of you, Father, through your Spirit, change hearts, transform lives. Energise us again to bring the good news of your change and your transformation to those around us. Amen. <laughs>